Welcome back to the I Have Cool Friends podcast. I am very excited to have Morin Surf on the show today. He's a neuroscientist and a business professor at the Kellogg School of Management and the neuroscience program at Northwestern University. In his work, Morin helps individuals and businesses harness current knowledge of the brain to improve thinking and understanding of customers and business decisions. So thank you so much for being on the show today. It's a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Of course. Where are you from? I was born in France and I was raised in Israel. So I would say something between those two. My parents are French, dad, and Israeli mom. And I guess I spent now a third of my life in the U.S. So at some point I should say that I'm American also. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll claim you definitely after all of your work. So what's your favorite? I guess that's a good question. Oh, it oscillates. I think I, think I have this uh, romantic uh, nature that uh, everywhere I am, I think it's the best place in the world to be. So right now I think, how could anyone want to live anywhere else but the U.S.? And when I was in Los Angeles, I thought that Los Angeles is the best city in the world. And I didn't understand why people didn't want to move there. And when I moved to New York, I said, this is the best city in the world. How would anyone want to be anywhere else? And it's true to places I even spend a week. In. You drop me for a week in uh, Alabama and I feel Alabama is the best state. You put me in Georgia. I think Georgia is the best state. So it's very, very uh very, very easy for me to fall in love with everywhere I am at the moment. Well, that's a, a really good philosophy to love the moment and the place that you're in at the time. But I've been to all of those places except Tel Aviv, and that has been on my list for a long time. It's a, a fun place. I think that depends on your uh, nature and character. It could be either a nightmare or a fantasy. So what is known about Tel Aviv is that it's really a non-stop city. So they say that New York is non-stop, but at 4 a.m. New York is pretty much closed. In Israel, you can find yourself calling a restaurant at 4 a.m. asking for a table, and they say, sorry, 4 a.m. is really busy. How about 5 a.m.? It's really like, and it's not uncommon for you to leave your place at like 5 p.m. to go meet a friend, and then the friend says, hey, I'm going to a different place. Come with me. And then you go to a different place, and then the people you meet there say, hey, we're going to a, a bar at this place, and you join people you know, and before long, you find yourself coming back home 24 hours later with people you've never met before. So it's really like that. So for some people, it's a blessing, and for some, it's a nightmare. All right, so full of party animals. I'm sure you had some fun there. Yes, it was really, really fun growing up there. Yeah. All right. Well, a little bit more background about you. Professor Cerf has a PhD in neuroscience, holds multiple patents, and has published over 60 academic papers in highly regarded journals. He's a speaker, author, and the beneficiary of several awards and grants for his work. He was recently named one of the 40 leading professors below 40. Additionally, he's the co-founder of Think Alike and founder of B-Cube, which applies neuroscience to help society. He's also been a consultant to many Hollywood films and TV shows such as Bull, Limitless, Falling Water, and more. And I got to say, you've been involved in so many different industries, many of which I didn't even name here. But I got to ask, is it true that before you had a PhD in neuroscience, you robbed banks? Yes. No matter what I do in my life, this is going to be the first thing that uh, people know about me. I, I was a child of the 80s. And uh, children of the 80s kind of grew up with computers such that we actually built them. We, we grew up with computers that had no hard drives, so had no you know, graphics. So we had to tinker with them and learn how to work the computers inside out. And this played out well uh, about 10 years after in the mid-90s when internet started becoming a thing. So me and my colleagues were pretty good in basically breaking into systems. And we would be hired by banks and by many government institutes to try to hack into their systems to see if there are going to be vulnerabilities. Now, I think it's a formal profession. It's called penetration tester. And there are many people who do that for a living. Back then, it was less known. But we would rob many banks and hack into many institutes, both virtually using computers and physically by actually going and robbing the bank, you know, the old-fashioned way just to show that it's possible. And then we would get paid a fraction of what we got as robbers to help the bank secure themselves better. Did it ever make you want to leave that very stable and um, morally sound profession to actually rob banks? I mean, I, I never really kind of considered that a, a like full-time job or career. But I think that the excitement that comes with that stayed with me to date. And I think I still try to incorporate things from that lifestyle into my career nowadays. So I'm known among my colleagues as the scientist who tries things first on himself before getting 
like the right kind of protocols. Uh, you know, I, I the students who come to me are former hackers mostly. The students who leave my uh, kind of lab many times go to work for companies as kind of you know, let's say hackers. So I, I think that it somehow stayed with me. Even the title is no longer the same. Yeah, it's it's not a bad title. Uh, makes you sound interesting, you know, a little bit bad, right? <laughs> you got that reputation for you. It's the 21st century version of having a leather jacket and a motorcycle. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Well, your academic research uses methods from neuroscience to understand the underlying mechanisms of our psychology, behavior changes, emotion, decision making, and dreams. How has this knowledge evolved over the last 10 years? I think that uh, I'll take one example out of those because there are so many uh, dreams. If you think about dreams, we've been fascinated by them for millennia. Go back to historical records on caves and hieroglyphs. You'll find people painting their dreams. If you take the Bible as a historic book, you'll find that it's full of people having dreams that are interpreted as the calling for war or uh, some kind of prediction of the future. Poets have written about those. So dreams were always fascinating and they have not stop being fascinating in the last 10, 15 years. The only difference is that now we have the tools to actually decode them and see them. So if you go to Freud and Carl Jung and all of the uh, fascinating people who studied dream 100 years ago, they actually didn't study dreams. Despite you know, our love for Freud, he could only talk about the dreams that you told him about when you woke up. So the person wakes up, tells Freud about the dream that she or he had, and then Freud tried to make meaning out of that. But we don't know that the story you tell when you wake up actually is your dream. It might have been something that your brain made up as soon as you woke up based on some cues that were there when you were awake. So Freud basically had no access to dreams. And this is true for most of the researchers up until the year 2000, roughly, where neuroscientists like myself developed tools that allow us to actually look at your brain when you're sleeping. So you're still asleep, your brain is still dreaming, and we can extract the dream. And now we can actually see the visual of your dreams and even change them. So this changed everything because now we talk about dreams. So when you wake up and I ask you, Samantha, what was your dream? Tell me a story. And I see that it has nothing to do with actually what I saw. I can ask the question, why is she telling me a story about her ex-boyfriend and how she feels about him when I clearly know that in her dream she saw her mom and her dad? And then we can kind of make more meaning of why you made up this story rather than that story and what actually was in your dream. And I can remind you of the dream that you actually had and see if it triggers a different memory. So a lot of things can be done now. And this is purely a toolkit that we developed. So we now have the tools to do it, and it totally changes how we look at dreams. And now the 10 years ahead are going to be the years of us actually exposing dreams, changing them, and using them as a tool to understand what's actually going on in our mind. So that's just one example. That is fascinating. And, and I'm somebody that has a dream every night, and I remember it. But what percentage of the people you've studied remember the accurate representation of what happened in their dream? So I was a bit a, a kind of too hard on dreamers' uh, stories as if they totally made up. The majority of dreams have some residue in reality. It's just that uh, some of it is made up. So I give you the, the kind of the classical example that will clarify that. There's a famous experiment uh, that had people go to sleep and the scientists waited for them to get to the dream state. And when the person is dreaming, they bang the symbol right next to their ears and quickly hide it. So the person wakes up with this big kind of sound of explosion. And then they ask the person who just woke up, tell us what your dream was about. And the person says, oh my God, I was walking in the street and suddenly there was an explosion. So I looked to my left and I saw that there's a house that collapses. So I ran into the house and there was a baby there and I saved the baby quickly. And then I remember there's a puppy there. And I said, so people basically take the uh, dream that they had, incorporate it with the thing that woke them up and make a new story that has cues for the dream. There probably was someone familiar there. There probably was something that they felt close to. But they change the story entirely. So I think that they uh, have con content from the dream spoken in the language of their wake self. I, I think that maybe a better example that would clarify that is that we have evidence now that people use the language of their awake self to describe their dreams in the following way. The people that are blind describe their dreams as if they had no visual in them because their awake self doesn't know what sight is. So they just use the language of their awake self to describe their dream. We don't know if they didn't see something in their dream, but they just don't know what seeing is when they speak. So that's how they talk about it. Same with people that are uh, deaf. They have no sound in their dream. Kids uh, describe only words that they know as things that happen in their dream, but maybe their dreams have visuals that they don't know how to name. People that have this disorder called uh, postapagnosia, where they can't really see faces, never see faces in their dreams. And the best example I have, that's the last one I'm going to give, otherwise I'm going to bore the audience, 
is that uh, somewhere in the early 1920s, there was a study where people were asked to write diaries about their dreams, basically describe their dreams in words. So people wrote long diaries describing their dreams, and then they did the same thing somewhere in the 1940s. And between the 20s and the 40s, a film started having color. And accordingly, if you look at the dreams in the 20s, all of them were described in black and white. And in the 40s, all of the dreams are in color. So people basically thought, okay, dreams are like a movie. How do movies look? Movies are in black and white. So I guess my dreams are in black and white. And they just described all the dreams in black and white and in color, not even knowing that they incorporate something from the outside world. So we don't know how the dreams actually looked like, but we know that they describe them in a way that depicts what they kind of know. So your dreams are true semantic-wise, like the content. You definitely had a dream about something that you love, something familiar, dangerous. You were feeling all of those things, but whether you saw it the way you imagine it as an awake person might not be the case. Interesting. So when you talk about the potential of manipulating dreams, um, you know, what what does that look like? And and I, I want to give you an example because this is really interesting for the athletic and the sports realm. When I was younger and doing gymnastics, I would have a dream that I could do a skill that I had never done before. So I would go in the next day and say, I saw it in my mind. I, I believe that I can do it. And then I would be able to just do it pretty naturally because I believe that I saw it in my dream. And so I even saw myself standing on a podium for an Olympic medal, you know, things like that. Is is it possible to manipulate dreams so people could, you know, get rid of their limiting beliefs, so to speak? So there's two things that you said that are both possible. One is right now there are a number of studies that basically use dreams as a platform to access your brain and change things that will stay with you when you're awake. So I give you an example that's concrete. Uh, the famous study that kind of opened this field happened in 2015, so five years ago. People that are smokers who tried to quit in various ways but failed were brought to the lab, were told, go to sleep, take a nap. So it wasn't even a full night's sleep. So take a two-hour nap. And when they're sleeping, the scientists spray into their nose in a specific moment, the moment where their brain kind of thinks about evaluating life. They spray the smell of nicotine, which triggers the thinking about smoking in the person's brain, and then immediately after, they spray the smell of rotten eggs, which is a known smell to uh, that kind of penetrates the brain, triggers negative, aversive experiences, but doesn't wake you up. That's the point. Like you're supposed to stay asleep. So it creates a conditioning between nicotine and bad things. Nicotine and bad things repeatedly over this window of time when you're sleeping, and then they let you kind of continue sleeping. And then when you wake up, you don't want to smoke anymore for about two weeks. This is how long it lasted, but you have no idea what happened. So you just feel that you don't want it. And you have no idea that in your sleep, someone did something. So that's an example of a clear kind of experiment that takes a person, does something to them when they're sleeping that affects their behavior when they're awake without them knowing what happened. So you can think about it as stopping smoking, like smoking cessation, or you can think about it as like making a person healthier or strengthen memories, make them remember things better or changing behaviors like you want to practice something. All of those things are possible. There are experiments with golfers that uh, basically trigger the, the golfer to dream that they're actually you know, making the, the move that they need to move. And what they show when they wake up is that they actually get better. So they, they practice some move, go to sleep. Someone makes their brain keep rehearsing this move when they're sleeping. When they wake up, they do it better. As if they're, they keep rehearsing for six hours while sleeping. So those two examples are evidence that the brain doesn't stop working when you go to sleep. It's working. We need to create these settings for what it should practice before we go to sleep. You can't teach someone a new thing when they're dreaming. You have to incorporate it before you go to sleep and then have the brain rehearse it or practice it or do something with it, change it, and then it works when you wake up. So for your example in practice, it's very likely that when you were awake, you were considering new moves and you were kind of thinking about which one. It was in your mind. So your your brain was prompted for that already. Then when you went to sleep, your brain created new movies with new moves based on the existing ones, different examples, and it actually filters them through your emotions. You kind of say, this one feels scary to me. This one feels that I uh, wouldn't be as impressive. Like you kind of practice all of the things that you have there and you filter them and you weigh them. So that when you wake up, you actually have answers. You said, this one is the winner. So this happens in your dream, but your brain chooses that. But you can't invent totally new things when you're dreaming. 
This research on dream dreams is relatively new, but how far along are, you know, neuroscientists in this process around the world? You know, is there, you know, you and four other um, neuroscientists doing these experiments? Is there a plethora of people? Are lots of universities studying dreams? Where are we at as a society? Relatively small still. I would say uh, less than 100 kind of scientists who are playing with kind of the hardcore manipulating. Uh, I would say a little bit more, maybe 300. If you count everything that has to do with kind of dreaming, not just like changing them, but just like explaining what could happen when you dream and so on. And I would say a lot more if you go to anything that has to do with like uh, dream diaries, like kind of that's more like psychology. You ask people to tell you stories and so on. And if I would go to thousands, if you incorporate uh, uh, charlatans who, uh, you know, tell you that they can, uh, you know, read your, uh, tell us your dream and we tell you why you want to sleep with your mom and kill your dad. Yeah. Uh, th- 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 if you go there, there's like a lot more. Right, right. So uh, in your professional opinion, where do you think we'll be with this research in five years? So I think that what's missing right now uh, is, uh, I'm, I'm surprised I'm saying that. It's not really what I would normally say. What's missing now is corporate partner that will actually take it and make it into a consumer uh, product. So the scientists, like myself, are doing it, we're not scalable. So, you know, we have 20 subjects come to the lab, we study them, we know a lot about that, but it doesn't translate to the masses. Your podcast will probably make it much more accessible than I ever did with my, you know, kind of labs, little posters that say that it's important. And I think that if Amazon said that they're going to connect Alexa to a, a device that actually knows that you're dreaming and can maybe help you have better dreams when you're suffering from a nightmare or maybe wake you up in the best moment such that you're feeling more alert. Or if Google will uh, create a little tool that when you wake up, it immediately asks you to kind of quickly put your dream in, in words and they transcribe it and then collect a massive list of dreams and they start saying, hey, there seems to be like a trend in dreams. If, if I, I'm just suggesting like two products, I can think of 20 others. But if someone made it into a kind of scalable thing, then it will start getting bigger and then it will be also something people will care about negatively and positively. So we spoke about it just as if it's a positive thing, but all of those companies have particular interests in a content that isn't necessarily aligned with our interests. So we would have to also decide how to work it into kind of something that we as a society benefit from, but aren't giving up entirely our own, you know, we have like, dream is ours when we sleep at like we're not giving like you know Amazon access to us that's complete. I'll say one thing about it that I was uh, in a conference now probably more than two years ago with uh, the CEO of Netflix. I'm not sure if it's the same CEO even still, but I assume it is. Uh, and uh, we had kind of a discussion, a panel on uh, technology, and I brought kind of a left field thing that uh, I think that uh, all of those companies that are kind of working right now on VR, I think was the the topic are doing a great job and it's interesting and so on, but it's nothing like a dream. Like VR, at the end of the day, is a goggle that you put on your eyes and if the dinosaur comes and you get scared, you just remove the goggles and that's it, you're back in reality. It's like very, very, when you're in the back of your mind, you always know that you're in a VR. So if you're scared of something, you can kind of wheel yourself to walking on this tightrope that is, you know, supposedly above like a high mountain and make it work because it's VR and you know it. Dreams are not like that. Dreams are the ultimate VR. When you're seeing a dinosaur in your dream, everything in your body responds to it as if it's real. That's a mechanism that nature gave us to actually rehearse things and feel them viscerally in our body so we know how to prepare for them and we correctly rehearse. So I said that uh, dreams are the ultimate VR and all those companies that are investing right now in VR, if they invested in dreams, manipulation and so on, they would have the ultimate experience. And I think the CEO of Netflix said something that stuck with me. He said that in his mind, it was kind of part of a joke, but he said in his mind, the biggest competitor for Netflix isn't YouTube or Hulu or, I don't know, cable TV, but sleep. And he said that if I can provide the tool that allows them to create content, you know, you go to sleep and you have a movie by Spielberg, then they're in. And I immediately saw the kind of, my eyes were, you know, kind of expanded by the opportunity. And secondly, I said like, oh, that's, that's kind of giving the, a third of our life uh, becomes now something that you know you watch more content than you sleep. So I think that there's there's a kind of a double-edged sword here. 
Yeah, that, that makes sense. And I'm just thinking, too, is there data yet to support the correlation between, you know, fighting dragons in your dream to building confidence, waking up with more confidence because you were able to defeat the dragon in your sleep or building grit because you had to do something brave in your dream. So you wake up with a little bit more grit the next day. Is there any data to support that yet? Absolutely. So one of the one of the kind of the few things that we know for sure, and one of them is that one of the functions of dreams is to simulate future events so our body can practice for them and rehearse them. So many times you people many people's dreams are that you're troubled by the kind of gymnastics act you're supposed to do, and it's really bothering you, and, and you're not sure how to do it, and you think your brain actually will create the entire experience. You, you will see yourself in the place that it's supposed to happen with the audience cheering and the judges and everything and you're gonna go through it and you're gonna do it well and you're gonna do it badly and you're gonna practice and it basically gives you practice that you can never get in real life like in, in the training you can't really simulate the tension that will be there in the room with the judges on, but in dreams you can so it, it's the best rehearsal you can get like it gives it and many dreams are just that many times our brain knows that we're troubled by some scenario so it creates it for us as a future thing and Let's us practice it and filter it to our emotions so we get resilience in our emotions. We know how to stay focused uh, in the moment. Unfortunately, up to now, up to recently, we didn't know how to summon it. So if you told me, Moran, I want to have this dream, I want to practice in my dream this thing, we didn't know how to. So we hope that your brain at some point will summon that for you. Now we started to develop that. So people basically come to the lab and say, I'm really worried about my board meeting tomorrow. How will I respond under stress with this pressure? I know that I'm practicing for that, but I don't know what to do. Can you create the ball meeting for me fully? So I would think it's happening and then practice. Can you have today, tonight as a debate? I'm sure that both candidates would have loved to have the debate like happen once before so they can see how they respond to things. And, and that's, I think, the, the job of neuroscientists right now is to ask people, what is it that you want? And we'll give you that dream rather than let your brain randomly pick it up if your brain thinks it's important as you do. Absolutely. And I mean, it, I'm going through all these scenarios in my head that would benefit from an activity like that experience like that, you know, uh, quarterbacks on Super Bowl Sunday, Olympic athletes in the finals, um, NBA finals just happened, you know, the presidential debate, soldiers. even just soldiers, somebody just applying for their dream job interview, you know, yes. going having having a fake interview in their dream, waking up feeling like they've been there, done that. So it's it's really fascinating um, with that work. And, and also a step further than that is talking about being able to control your emotions in real life. Um, you know, is that possible? Is it possible to train your brain to be happier or more fulfilled? Yes. So, so that's a fantastic topic and, and a big one. So we'll, I'll start with the bad news and then go to the good news. The bad news is that emotion regulation, that's the term that we use for kind of controlling your emotion scientifically, is Partially, but a big part of it, genetic. So be, some people are just born better at it, and some people are born worse at it. And that's that's the bad news because you start the the race either already at the finish line almost, and or in the beginning starting line. Like it, some people just are. So that's the bad news. The good news is that it can be trained to an extent that makes it almost indistinguishable from people who are good at it to begin with. Scientists speak about what they call kind of a personality traits. As in kind of what's your core identity, things that uh, are who you are, almost irrespective of the situation. So let's say uh, your the example would be you're an introvert. So introverts are introverts from a certain age when it's kind of locked into their personality. And from then on, this is who they are for the rest of their lives. Now, introverts can act like extroverts. They can look like they're, like they're not. But at, at, the, at the core, they are, which means that it will take a bigger toll. So if you're a Steve Jobs, let's take him, who claimed that he was an introvert, but his job required him to go on stage every quarter and present a new iPhone and a new Mac and really kind of act publicly as if he's a, a vocal person who loves the audience, he could do that. He could act out of nature. But it meant that at the end of this one-hour presentation, he would be exhausted. Like he needed time off. So, so you can act out of character, but it takes a toll. So if taking emotional regulation, if you're a person who has naturally the ability to emotional regulation acts kind of, then it means that when something bad happens, you just kind of wave it off without any problem. If your person doesn't have it, you can train for that, but it means that it will take a cognitive load and you will be tired elsewhere. You might not be able to do it 
continuously. You might you know, do it four times and then the fifth time it just be too much, or you might need to go to sleep afterwards and so on. So practically, what is there to do uh, to do that? Emotion regulation. There are kind of a few techniques. Typically, based on who you are, we find the one that's right for you. It ranges from some people need to literally tell the story multiple times to others and have the other person give them a view, different viewpoint. So they can't do it alone. Like, like someone hurt you, you have to, you're feeling bad, you have to have a person, it could be a friend or a therapist or almost stranger. It doesn't matter really who the person is, it just needs to be not you. So you will actually tell them the story and they will say something that will just make you reframe the story in your mind and then it's going to be overwriting in your brain differently. So you need a different person to whom you tell the story. That's that's one type of emotional regulation. The, the act of telling loads the memory, makes it be seen by different perspective, and then be overwritten. So it changes. That's the mechanics of that. Some people uh, can do that by actually what's called a cognitive behavioral therapy. They actually expose themselves again and again to the thing that they are don't are not happy with. And what happens is that their brain learns to cope with that better by exposure. So you you have uh, something that hurts you, a friend that hurts you. You actually spend more time with her or him, and first time it hurts you nine, and you go back home and it's crashing. And then you come back and do it again, and the next time it's going to be eight, seven. Your brain basically gets trained to do that by exposure. Tough one because it requires multiple times of being hurt. It's an- another one. There are of course ways uh, by which therapy works. As in, you go to therapist and you try to kind of learn how your what triggers your emotions and how to un- identify when the emotions are triggered fast and. Uh, Techniques to handle that that are kind of more uh, internal, like you tell yourself a different story, or you try to find comfort zones, like things that make you feel safe and in, in light and so on and so on. And I can go on and on. Uh, there are many, but I think that the point is that there are more than one, there's more than one technique. And typically the, the, the important thing is to recognize that you need it and find the one that works for you fastest, best, and the least kind of hassle. One of the main things that I'm hearing you say is kind of that developing a self-awareness, right? Because if you notice that you're angry when something happens, but you're not necessarily self-aware to realize that um, you could feel a different emotion if you changed your perspective, then you probably aren't going to be able to make a change. And I, I listened to, I don't know if you saw the Netflix special with Brene Brown, but she does this whole bit on um, the story I tell myself, which I thought was really interesting because everybody has a different perspective on, you know, you can ask somebody a, a jar of peanuts, how many peanuts are in here? Somebody can say hundreds, somebody can say a thousand, but it's the same jar of peanuts. And so, you know, I did that with myself with a few times I, my boyfriend and I had gotten to an argument or my parents or somebody else. And it was really interesting because although I could change my re- reaction or emotion, it wasn't automatic. So what's the next step from realizing that you can change your emotion to making it an automatic reaction? So so the, the first thought that, that, that kind of came to mind when you spoke about that is that one thing that everyone should know before I go to neuroscience is that, and it's not you, like I think Buddhist monks have been saying for a while, but now there's scientific back that the Experience is independent of the perception, meaning you being told by your boyfriend something that is not nice is one thing. How you experience it is up to you in your brain. I'll give you a concrete example that would make it clear. If you uh, go to the gym and you exercise fiercely, you feel extreme pain in your body, like it's so everything is. If you felt the same pain and, and the same kind of physical experience without being in the gym, just momentarily. One morning you woke up with this thing, you would go to the emergency room right away. So the fact that you know that this pain is attached to you being in a gym for one hour before that makes the experience different. And I say, okay, I know what prompted it. I know that it's the outcome of me working hard. I know it's going to go away in half an hour. The same pain without knowledge about the before, if you just walk and feel suddenly that you can't move your, your arm, and say, oh my God, my body is falling apart, emergency right away. So it's the same physical pain. It's just the context it's put makes us respond totally differently and makes us believe that it's going to go away, makes us believe that it's actually a positive thing rather than a negative thing, and so on. That's, that's an example of a lot of things in our life. You hear something bad. If you're on a, a film set and you say, oh, this is something that they, was part of like the show. I'm not really that person that they say. It's just I'm an actress. This is what happens. Totally different experience if the same words came from your mom on a phone call when you kind of talk to her. So I think that what a lot of training that is done 
generally with data neuroscience is an understanding how to kind of separate the in- input from the perception. And the better you are at that, you can choose whether you get hurt, whether you don't get hurt, uh, how fast you get hurt, uh, how long you get hurt. All of those things are, are things that you can train yourself to be good at. And I think that's what a lot of us, as we grow up, train ourselves to do naturally, but you can do it better with help and you can do it better by practice. That's the non-neuroscience. The neuroscience part, I would say, let's say just one uh, kind of minute because this might be a snooze for some other people, is that we're getting better and better in understanding how to make it happen to you in your brain by understanding your brain. So subjects who come to my lab, we scan their brain, we study their brain and we tell them, look, you, Samantha, are the kind of person that will need 20 minutes to recover from bad experience, whereas your boyfriend needs only 16 minutes. Actually, it's, it's definitely true. Men and women take different time, general, on average, to, res- to recover from negative experiences. This is why sometimes you have a fight with your boyfriend and you make up. And then five minutes later, he says something uh, that seems like he forgot entirely that it was a fight and you're still in fight mode because it will take you 10 minutes to decay, but you kind of feel, did you forget it, it? So like it kind of uh, start again. So we know that generally but men and women, there's a difference in like, the time it takes for emotion to decay, the half-life of negative emotion. But the point is that we now can scan the brain of each individual and help him or her understand their profile better. And we can tell you, you're the kind of woman who whose pain threshold is this. So when you hear the same words that your best friend hears, you will respond totally differently. So don't get mad at her when she doesn't understand why she said it and you got so emotional. And, and in a way, if we get to a state where we can take the entire world and give each and every person their kind of brain scorecard, then I think we can align people. We can say, you know what? Just know that you and your boyfriend are not aligned on this experience. So be nicer to him when he says this thing. Don't get mad because he just can't. Like for him, the empathy that he can give is not the one that you need. And that's the gap. And he can give you a lot of things otherwise. But on this one, you should know that there's a challenge there. That's uh, so interesting. Is there an age that your perception or your your building this kind of concrete um, reality in your mind is more concrete or more malleable than another age? So generally, we say that kind of that all average, like now we say that 50% of who you are is determined by your genes. So zero. When you're born, it's already 50% written. Then, so you have still half of your personality to develop. So now there's kind of the, the, the next quarter. So we already got half when you're born. Quarter more happens between age zero to five. So basically, that's your imprint of your parents on you and your experience as a baby. And then between five to 17, the remaining. Uh, roughly at age 17, you're fixed. From then on, you can still act differently, but it will take a toll. So if you're a person that was 17 years trained to be uh, late to places, and suddenly your job requires you to be on time, you will be on time, but you will be exhausted like from the effort you would have to exert to be there on time compared to a person who was trained for the 17 years to be on time and just does it without feeling any effort. It's scary to think about. I spent probably five hours a day in the gym um, from like the ages of eight to, to 17. I wonder what that did to my psyche. So I'm pretty sure that uh, so I'm pretty sure that it determines a lot of kind of who you are right now. You know, uh, like you told me that you're gonna send me a plan for this podcast exactly five minutes before, and I think five minutes to the second, I got the email from you, uh, and I said, "Oh, that's strange." Like uh, five minutes, like let's say. But I guess like to me, like your your perception of time presumably is geared by that because you trained. You know, you you like you know how much is three seconds. A lot of people don't know how much is three seconds. They kind of think, okay, so so. Athletes know that they know their body really well. So there's like a a sixth sense called proprioception, the feeling of our body. Everyone has that. We think that we have only five senses, but we actually have a lot more. And one of them is the feeling of your body. Everyone knows exactly where their legs are, where their arms are at any given moment. If you woke up for a second, you were injured and you didn't have your left arm, you would know without having to look at it. Like your brain would just know. Gymnasts, like, like you have super high level of that like you know not only where your butt like you know how much muscles you have you probably know your metabolism better than all of those things are physical things that you were trained for between the age of 18 8 sorry and onward and you're better at that like you don't know that there's other options but but that's the case like you you're you and a lot of people who listen to it right now probably each have some skill that they harnessed better than anyone else and they think it's the world but it's actually their life right 
Right. Well, using your knowledge, I know that you've worked, I mean, you are a business professor, but I know you've also worked with a lot of companies and helping them understand, you know, their products, uh, the psychology of con- consumers and why they want to purchase certain things and why they don't want to purchase other things and, and maybe how to manipulate that situation a little bit more. What's the most eye opening thing you've learned in your research with businesses? I think that ties with what Brené Brown said before. I think that what we learned is that people uh, make up a story of why they have what they have of the decisions on the spot, and they immediately change the past to align with that. So the example we do in our lab that kind of talks speaks to that is we have this study where we bring people to the lab. So let's say you're a subject. So you come to the lab and we tell you, Samantha, we're going to show you uh, two cards with two pictures of guys. You don't know them. They're unknown. But you see two pictures, and we ask you to choose which one you find more attractive, the guy on the left or the guy on the right. So you look at it for a second, and you say, definitely the guy on the left. So you say, fantastic. Here's the card that you pick. Hold it in your hand, and tell us in one sentence why you picked this guy. And you might say, eh, his smile is really, really cute. Say, so perfect. Keep this card. We're going to show you two new guys that you didn't see before. We show you again two pictures. You again make a choice. This time you choose the right one. We give you the card, and we ask you to explain. And you say, I really like his uh, hairstyle. Fine, we do that for about an hour. For an hour, every couple of seconds, we show you two pairs of cards, you make a choice, explain it, and go on. That's the experiment from your perspective. What actually happens is that uh, the guy who's handing you the card isn't just a regular guy. He is a magician, and he uses sleight of hands to give you occasionally, every, say, 20 tries or so, the card he didn't choose. So if you chose the card on the right, he gives you the card on the left. And you don't notice that, mostly. And then what happens is that you go on and explain to us why the choice that you didn't make was your choice. So you chose A, we give you B, you take B, and you say, I wanted B because I really like his eyes. And this is just one example to show that the reality is that we make choices at time zero. But when we're asked to explain them, we have no idea why we made the choices in time zero. We just come up with an answer on the spot. And take it into the world of business, many times, People go to the supermarket, let's say, and they have to buy a toothpaste. Okay, so there's like a Colgate on the left and Crest on the right, and you start debating between the two, and you look at the package and the price and the uh, volume, and you know one of them is minty and one of them is whitening, and you put like a table of a, of a Excel table full of like a pros and cons of each of them, and then you choose one of them. You made a choice. Your brain made a decision, and now you go to the to the checkout to buy this thing, and between the moment you made the choice and the checkout. I sneak into your basket and I replace the choice you made with the other choice. There's a chance that if the choice isn't important for you, kind of like the two cards that you made, if it's not critical to your life, you won't notice that I replaced choice one and choice B. You will buy whatever was there. And if I even stop you in the way outside, there's a marketing research team and I say, why don't you to explain to us why you chose this one? You will come up with an answer. And by coming up with an answer, you can convince yourself this is true. So all I'm saying here is aligned with what you spoke about earlier on the stories, we make up our story all the time on the spot and we change the past to align with that. Like we say, all my life I wanted to be that, even though it's the first time you, you wanted it, but now suddenly it feels like all your life was building up to this moment. You kind of tell yourself a story. And in that sense, when I talk to companies, I often tell them, you spend a lot of time convincing people to buy something by giving them information, by giving them kind of details, thinking that the table that they make is the key thing. It's not. It's the story that they make afterwards that is important. Help them make a story that incorporates your product into their life. And suddenly, they're going to find a way to tell themselves why, even though yours is more expensive and smaller and has the ugliest package, is exactly what they wanted because all their life they were not into brands. They wanted like, a, they, they're going to come up with a story. So, so if you can help them craft a story that aligns the product with them, they're going to find a way to make all the bad things about you great. And I think this happens all the time. An example would be, I. I Worked with companies, for instance, that tried for the life of them to understand why people buy Apple. Right? Those are companies that are not Apple that say, why do people love Apple so much? And these companies come and say, look, our phones are much better on reception and on size and so on, but still people buy Apple. And I tell them that's the story that Apple created is a story that kind of everything that you're going to do better, people are going to find it as a flaw. Yeah, but it's like not that. So I think that's, that's, that's just one example of many that companies are struggling with, which is kind of how you tell your story rather than how you build features. 
So do you believe marketing nowadays, especially with social media, is much more important than maybe some would argue the actual product? Obviously, the product has to be a good product. But, you know, if you compare one product to the other and one has better marketing, is that mo- almost more important than the actual product these days? I would say it in, using uh, words that you used before. So I think that to be an NBA player, you have to clear a certain bow height. Like you can't be shorter than X to be an NBA. But a lot of people clear that bow. And from then on, it's something else. It's how you play as a team. It's how you stand like under pressure. It's how much are you willing to exercise and, and practice. This. So there are a lot of like, I don't know, six, ten. I don't know if there are, but like six, seven uh, uh, people. Not all of them are NBA players in the top league. At some point, it's not just like whether you're... So your product has to... You know, if you're offering a cell phone, it has to make calls. Let's let's uh, let's start it there, and it probably has to weigh a certain amount. It, like, there, there are some kind of clear, but then from then on, then on, they're all pretty much similar. And now it's the story that you tell, uh, your understanding of your customers, how you can uh, align with a lot of things that they want that might be trivial. Like you might, uh, I'll give you a concrete example. I spent time talking to Facebook to the engineer at Facebook. So that's a concrete example of like help. And they were building a products that were amazing. In the, this, this, is the, this is the part of Facebook that actually is uh, speaking to other divers. So this is the behind the scene. It's not the part that most people see. It's the part that kind of, they, they business to business. They try to convince people to actually put ads on Facebook. And they were building tons of features and they were listing them every week, more and more of them. And the customers were not happy. And the engineers couldn't figure out why they give more to people and people are less happy. And when I asked the customers, why? They said, like I said, every week we have new features. We have to learn how to work them. My boss is angry at me because I don't, we pay so much to Facebook and I'm not using all of the features. So they got angry at Facebook for giving them more things. And I think this is something that we constantly have to help customers understand. And sometimes giving you more things makes you feel like as a customer, I don't use all the things I have there. So I'm not using it right and I must be stupid. And suddenly you make people less happy by giving them more. So we constantly have to help them figure out what is that people actually want that will make them happy rather than just like saying we're a lot more than the others. In terms of the the narrative and the content, how can businesses, entrepreneurs become more engaging using neuroscience? So that's another huge topic that, that, that uh, I would love to talk more and you've got to stop me because I feel that I'm answering in such a length that your audience might hate me. No, uh, <laughs> no, they're fascinated. I, I'm fascinated. So generally, the, the, we invented this, this new type of research in the last couple of years. It's the study of engagement brain-wise. So we're trying to understand what makes things interesting brain-wise. In a way, it will be trivial. And in a way, it's fascinating. So the trivial part is that we learned some things that everyone kind of intuited. We learned that shorter messages work. We learned that being funny works. We learned that usually one thing at a time is better than multiple. If you have like on the screen too many things running, we learned things that, that Hollywood has been doing for decades and, and they're doing it well. So we didn't kind of change the world entirely. But what we learned it by is uh, looking at the brains of people when they watch content. So we don't need to ask you anymore what you think is making things engaging. We actually look at your brain while you watch a movie, while you watch a commercial, while you listen to a speech. And we tell the speech writer or the movie creator or the ad marketing manager what worked and what didn't work, not by asking a single question, but looking at the brains of people. And I think that where it takes us to is a world where we can actually start tailoring content perfectly to you. And that is kind of what is interesting right now. We learned that it's very hard to be engaging for a long period of time, constantly at 100%. So if I'm trying my best now to be constantly interesting in the entire 45 minutes that we're talking right now, I will fail. At some point, people will just tune out. But since people tune out at some point, if I decide when to do that, I can control letting them tune and then bring them back. So we basically speak out pauses a lot. We say like, you choose when you give a 45 minutes talk, when you tell people, now for the next minute, I'm going to speak about a specific uh, part of my healthcare plan. Now, those of you who don't care about it, please don't listen for a minute and I'll tell you when to come back. And those of you who care, stay with me. And then you basically tell the audience, now is the time to take a breath. And then you speak for a minute about your own health plan and say, guys, now I want everyone back because this is important. And then you get everyone back and suddenly the point after is going to work out. So in many ways, we teach people that being boring is okay as long as you choose when to and for how long. 
that makes me think of, I don't know if you've seen the Social Dilemma documentary, but, you know, they talk a lot about the negative effects on detailed automatic responses of what you tailored, tailored social media, essentially, um, on Instagram, the videos you watch, YouTube, the next video that comes up automatically will kind of be tailored to what you've researched, what you like. And that has kind of built a, a bigger divide politically and with a lot of other social issues in our world to kind of have negative effects a lot more you know, what they're suggesting is um, suicides and young kids and, you know, all these other things. So I believe that, you know, you're doing such great things. Do you think that there's a negative side of learning too much about the brain and that manipulation process? Yes. So Tristan Hallis, the guy who basically is the kind of person who speaks about Facebook's uh, and Google's experience from his own working there is a good friend of mine. So, so I had that oh. first front, front row seat to this entire experience. We spoke a lot about that uh, earlier. And he's doing a tremendous job in like getting the message to everyone. I think, you know, we've been trying to do that for the last seven years. And what he's done in this one hour movie changed everything. So I feel that this is like really on the dinner table of every family now. I, I think that, uh, yes. So I, I think that it is dangerous. And I think that we're only touching the tip of the iceberg on how dangerous it is. So the, the, the film did depict a little bit of the neuroscience of addiction and kind of what happens in the brain. We know every day a little bit more. And it's, it somehow doesn't feel like addiction to people because addiction, like when you consume something, it feels, okay, I'm doing something. It clearly is addiction and there's molecules there. When you view something, we don't think about it as an addictive thing because it's only content. But turns out that from the brain's perspective, it doesn't matter for the brain if the content that activates neurons came from the stomach or came from the eyes. As soon as it's in the brain, it's just neurons firing. The brain doesn't even know that it's different. So all the neuroscience evidence that we have suggests that it is addictive, that it is uh, changing our brain faster than we thought, like that people who spend X amount of time, months, immersed in some things actually change their brain structure. Like we can actually see whether you are a kid who watches uh, YouTube for six hours a day or eight hours a day or one hour a day in your brain, just a snapshot of your brain. And I think that I can speak about it a lot. So I'll give you just one concrete sentence that will, I think, tell the entire story. A lot of my students, PhD students, who finish their PhD with me, my wish for them is that they would go to academia and they become professors and they continue the research. Most of them don't because they get a very, very uh, lucrative offer from Silicon Valley to go work for those companies. So Silicon Valley is populated right now by former neuroscientists, not by engineers, not by programmers, by former neuroscientists whose bread and butter is knowing how the brain works and how to manipulate it while going to the uh, companies to be used as employees. To me, that's that's the signal that we know that something is uh, happening that, that should be kind of noted. Well, you know, you got to give the opposite side of the spectrum too, which I always say, and Steve Jobs was spending how long on a computer growing up and he created Apple and all of the the products and and was kind of the brains behind that. Whereas like, you know, somebody, the kid that's spending maybe six hours a day on YouTube versus one hour a day, maybe that kid is going to develop, you know, a cure for cancer, digitally speaking, or, you know, neurologically speaking, or I don't know, something crazy. So it's hard to say, you know, it's all bad or it's all good, whereas like, okay, maybe this kid is going to become the next blank. So I, I'm that kid, right? I was a kid of the 80s. I'm a kid of so I, I, I it's, it's so I, I'll say that the, I think that the definition of addiction is that you want to not do something and it still happens. So I think that I'm on the camp that if the parents and the kids decide that nine hours of YouTube is what they want because that's great, and if then if it's great if it does, but if you decide that you want six and you end up in seven, then it's something that doesn't work. So I think that every person, every family, every individual can decide for themselves what they want. Addiction starts when you say, I don't want to do something, and it still happens. If you say, I want to drink two glasses, and you end up picking six, then you're an addict. If you say, I want to drink six, and you drink six, great. So I think that the, the, the key thing here is for everyone to decide what their trajectory. And I think that the battle, uh, and the reason I, I am kind of uh, spending time talking to those companies, helping them in a way, but also spending time talking to the other side, to the government, basically, and saying how to be, is I think that... Uh, Humans as a species right now are not good in controlling ourselves generally. Like we're, we're leaning towards addiction generally. So uh, most of us are eating more than we want to. We're sleeping less than we need to. We exercise less than we need to. So most, so it's just, there's just too many candies out there and our brains are challenged by them. So I think that we should help the brain be in control. And being in control means that you choose the amount of sugar you want. 
You choose the amount of sleep you want. You choose the amount of the, the exercise you want, and you stick with it. I think that's the difficulty for me. Like when people want something, it doesn't happen. As long as you want it, I'm okay with anything. If you don't want it, then someone needs to help you because our brain is kind of challenged by those things. The world becomes harder. Right. Absolutely. Well, as much as I would want to continue to ask you questions, we have a new segment on the show called Ask a Friend. People called in, left a voicemail, and I've curated their questions. And I think we only have time for one, but I think it's a really important question. This is John from Oregon. And he said, you speak a lot about free will. Do we, in fact, as humans, have free will? Well, John, what a good ending. <laughs> the, that's the bad news is that we have terrible answer to that. But I'll give you kind of the, the, the best news we can give you and some take-home message. Studies of free will are kind of the studies of the Big Bang for physicists. For physicists. We can go all the way to the very first moment, but not before that. Right? Every, everyone wants to know what happened before the Big Bang. How did the world start? Yes, we can explain that there was a centered mass and singular spot that exploded and everything. That's cool. But we want the fraction of a second before that. And that's where physics stops. Same with free will. We can take you farther and farther from the action. We can explain what you're going to do seconds, 10 seconds, quite a few even minutes sometimes before the action happens, but we never know how it started. And what people want to know is that did it start freely or some mighty powers that are beyond me trigger the action? We don't know. So where neuroscientists are spending most of the time right now is going farther and farther ahead of the action and telling you that it's going to happen. So we tell you uh, when you're going to raise your hand or what you're going to choose in the restaurant given the options in the menu. And it's remarkable to know that we can tell you that uh, John is going to order the salmon in the restaurant in 10 minutes when he right now doesn't even know what the options are. That's already remarkable. But it's not what you asked. What you wanted to know is like, can you determine that I'm going to have the salmon 20 years ago when I was just born? And unfortunately, we have no answer to how it starts. We're kind of stuck there. I would say that the take-home message from, from this uh, John is that uh, the only thing we know for sure is that the time that you think is the time you made the choice is not the time you made the choice. So if I ask you right now what you want to order in the menu, in the restaurant, and you say, I want the uh, salad, and I ask you, when did you make the choice? And you say, right now. We know that's not true. The choice was made before. If someone had access to your brain, they could have predicted you're going to choose a salad seconds, 10 seconds, maybe minutes before you made it. So definitely happened before, and you will get, get access to it only at the last minute. But when was the first moment? We don't know that. Understood. It's a lot to take in. And, uh, you know, I think I stumped you on the last question. I guess John stumped you on the last question of not really knowing the the beginning of free will and where that all starts. So since I know that you're just not that busy, I'm sure you can just add another research topic onto your plate, right? I'm writing it down. John from Oregon. <laughs> That's how you're going to name the research. And in one year, you can ask me what we learned. Great, great. I hope you give uh, the I Have Cool Friends podcast a little shout out when you <laughs> when you have it figured out. Promise. <laughs> all right, moving on to the I Have Cool Rec segment. Since you're one of my cool friends, I'm assuming you also have cool recommendations for our guests. So I would love to know a new current book recommendation that you have. Okay. Uh, I'm currently reading a book called Galileo and Science Deniers by this guy, Mario Livio. Uh, it's... I'm not sure it's going to for everyone, but I found myself, it's about Galileo's life, Galileo Galileo's life and kind of how he struggled with uh, science deniers. The thing about, I like about this book is that I read a chapter every say, day, and the day after, I go to a gathering with friends or a phone call or a Zoom or something, and I find myself using a brain nugget from the book in session. It's just full of things you can throw in a conversation that change the topic to the inspiring ideas with a lot of like fun facts that make it so that you really find yourself the highlight of conversations. I recommend it just for that. Forget about like Galileo even, like just the, the, the sheer amount of things you will learn that you can use. Fantastic. Do you have a, a favorite fun fact that you use in conversations? Um, I think that the one I'm using right now a lot is the, is the one that speaks to when he was, a, he built a telescope. This was his thing. He built a telescope and he looked at uh, Jupiter and he saw the moons of Jupiter orbiting and he realized quickly that to explain how they orbit the planet, the only way to go about it is that to understand that the Earth is in the center of the universe. Everyone thought that up to that point, Earth is the center and everything revolves around that. And he quickly got to understand that the sun is and we're just one rock orbiting a bigger planet, a bigger star. And it changed his entire kind of 
framing of life. Like you really had to accept that we're not center of the universe. And where I take it is that in many ways, scientists, speaking to John's question about free will, we begin to understand that in our own brain, we're not the center of the universe. Like in our own head, there are things that happen that control who we are, that we don't understand, that happen to us. And we think that we're the center and that whatever we say is the most important thing, that decisions that we make are explainable because we said them and so on. And I think the humility that Galileo had to accept that he doesn't, that, that, that might, he might just be one rock orbiting a bigger one. If we apply the same to our own brain, we can understand the most interesting thing in the universe, which is us. Gotcha. Wow. All right. Podcast recommendation. Oof, I'm bad at that. There was a podcast that I used. I don't know if it still exists. It's, it's someone I know. He's a comedian. His name is Brian Finkenstein. And he had a, a podcast called Brian Tells John About the View, where it was he and his friend, uh, Brian Finkenstein, and I don't remember who John's uh, last, what John's last name is, but basically the episode was the podcast once a week. And it starts with Brian asking John if he, uh, John has kids and he's like a really busy man. And Brian is a single comedian, like kind of has a lot of time on his hand. And it always starts with Brian saying to John, so did you watch The View this week? If you don't know The View, it's like this. Uh, and Brian, John says, what are you talking about? We have no time to watch The View. And what is this thing? And the entire podcast is Brian telling John about episodes of The View for that week. But they basically take it to talk about politics. Like they kind of riff off of it. Like it's, it's kind of a com- comedian's opener. But then it goes to talk about politics and about the opinions of things. And it's, it's, it's like a, it's exactly what I like, which is there's a kind of a skeleton that makes it funny. And even the title is funny, but actually ends up being really serious and covering a lot of topics that are like, interesting. I don't know if it still exists, but if it does, that's like a funny one that I liked. I'll have to check that out. I, I like that idea of taking a very common show, The View, and taking your own spin on it um, using those hot topics. That's a that's a cool idea. All right. What about a TV show or movie recommendation? I, I, you know, here, my favorite TV show is The West Wing. And I you know this is like 20 years ago. It's ages, ages, uh, ages old. Uh, but I think that they are just now coming up with a new episode that maybe came out yesterday. So in light of the election, I think they asked Aaron Sorkin and the entire crew of the West Wing from 2001 to come together and put an episode somehow about now. So it's not even like a dating. It actually is like I can say, oh, the West Wing from three days ago. It's current. Yes. All right. Do you have a friend of yours that's doing something cool or noteworthy you? that you want to hype up? What about you? Can I do that? Allowed? You're the first person to say <laughs> that. Wow. Thank you. But no, I think you should pick somebody else. <laughs> I'm sure there's a lot more people doing cooler things than than me. Okay. I, should, I shouldn't be a scientist because so uh, otherwise it's going gonna, it's gonna, to uh, place me as like just talking to the scientists. So here's a friend that I really like. I have a friend, David Goldberg. Uh, he's American. He's from San Francisco, but I think right now is mostly in uh, London. And he created this organization called the Founders Pledge. And the Founders Pledge is an organization that has the following premise. They go to entrepreneurs when they're starting a company in a very early stage. So if you start a startup today and you have nothing, you have, you're just like two guys in a garage with an idea, they would come to you and they would say, uh, we're going to help you. We're going to give you resources. We're going to connect you with the right people. We have a network of... And, and what we want from you is to pledge right now that when your company becomes a billion dollar company, when you sell and you go to the stock exchange, when you go public and so on, will you pledge to give 10% of your income to causes? They go to startups or to people that already are established, but they basically meet them at a very early stage, ask them to donate to good causes early on. And when those mature, they give the quotas and they have now billions of dollars. That is a very cool concept. And also building that community with the, with the network as you get going, you know, as an entrepreneur can get lonely, you can feel lost, you can feel, you know, all of the negative emotions. It's really a true peaks and valleys kind of a emotional roller coaster until you make it big. So it's great that he's committed to, you know, working with founders and, and helping them achieve success. So thank you for the recommendation. And thank you so much for being on the show today and sharing all of your knowledge with us. How can listeners follow you or find you on social media? So I'm the easiest guy to find being a scientist. You just type my name on any search engine and you see my website and my email is on the front page. And I answer every email that people send me. I'm the easiest guy to find. I try my best to also do things outside of my own website, like put stuff on like Twitter and Facebook. And, and I think that I spent a lot of time uh, you know, giving public talks. So I think I'm by now the most uh, TED and TEDx speaker in terms of amount of like 11 TEDx talks. So I try to do one every year. I, I try my best to kind of 
put the word out there. Uh, so I'm the easiest to find. I'm a bit too easy, to, I want to say. Well, when I was doing some, you know, biographical research, I found your website, which is amazing. And then I have to admittedly say that I got down a very deep rabbit hole on YouTube of watching all of your talks. I I had a little bit of knowledge coming into this, but it was truly, you know, so interesting and hearing your research. And of course, it's always evolving. So we'll have to have you back on the show when you uh, have a little bit more knowledge for us. I promise. Pleasure. Really. All right. Sounds good. Thank you so much. And for all of you listeners, thank you. And make sure to subscribe to the podcast. Don't forget, you can use the friend line to ask your questions about business, wellness, and personal development. You can find that number on my website, IHaveCoolFriends.com. Make sure to leave a comment and get in on the follow-up conversation on our Facebook, Instagram, or YouTube channel. Thank you again. And we will see you next week for another new episode.